So I, I want to talk today about happiness uh, and how happiness works. So uh, partly about happiness at work and partly about happiness in our lives, in our communities, and why I think happiness is so functional, why it really, really helps us, uh, not only us, but other people, lead good lives. But I, I, you probably, some of you have probably been watching this last few weeks, if you watch TV, some of the Winter Olympics, and, um, and it reminded me of the fact that, you know, last summer we had the Olympics in London, and... Um, and if you remember, I don't know if you know this, but the, the opening ceremony is the most watched television program on the planet. And it's actually, and um, it's the most watched program, certainly of the Olympics. The second most watched is the closing ceremony, and then the third is the 100 meter final. And so it's interesting that it's about the sense of community around Olympics that is the most watched. And there's been this escalating game, uh, game between nations that the opening ceremony is sort of the pride of the nation. And if you remember the week before the Olympics, I think, well, I think we were all very nervous as Brits, you know, how are we going to look in the world? And they promised us sheep and England's pleasant land. And I know here in Devon we're in England's pleasant land, and I was out in the countryside today, and, you know, it is absolutely stunning. But it sort of seemed a bit embarrassing that that was all we were going to get in the opening ceremony. And uh, luckily, you know, we got Mr Bean... And we got the Queen jumping out of a helicopter, and it was all absolutely fantastic. But for me, <laughs> the favourite part of the opening ceremony was the scene about the Industrial Revolution. And I think as Brits, we can often feel quite guilty about our past, but something extraordinary happened in this country, which was an absolute revolution in the way that the whole of humanity has worked, which was that... Um, Machines like this, the, this is an uh, image of the James Watt steam engine, transformed work, transformed people's lives, absolutely. It, he, James Watt, was a Scot, um, though he, he mainly worked in Birmingham, as it happened, um, and he was the first person to create a steam engine that could turn rotary power, which is what you needed for mills, for uh, looms, and things like that. Previously, there had been something called the Newcomb steam engine, uh, they were used quite a lot in actually Devon and Cornwall in the mines, and they could pump water out of the mines. And the Watt steam engine could do that too, but he managed to turn power rotary. And obviously he was um, using fossil fuels, uh, coal, to power these, and we know there were negative consequences of that. And obviously there were lots of negative consequences of moving people from the land to the cities and things like that. But the whole planet is still playing out on this industrial revolution now. Uh, through their lives. And, and the whole of humanity has been transformed, starting with machines like this. And this is a technical drawing of James Watt's steam engine. And he had this imagination he wanted to create a perfect engine. And he had to do so many inventions to do that. When he was working, people didn't even understand that water was, as he came to call it, two parts air. They didn't know it was that. It was thought of as an essential element. They didn't know about latent heat or anything. And he designed lots of fantastic things. But I want to talk to you, and you're probably wondering, why am I talking about steam engines when I'm talking about happiness? But I want to talk to you about this small part of his steam engine because it's exceptionally, uh, I think it's a beautifully simple device. Um, it's called a governor. And a governor is what controls the amount of steam into the steam engine. So as the steam uh, flows in from the bottom of this diagram, um, the balls are they're spinning round, and it moves them out, which transmits the information to the valve at the bottom and reduces the amount of steam going into the steam engine. So the balls go out, it reduces the steam, they come in again, and it's the first example of a machine that was a self-organizing sort of uh, uh, machine that used a feedback loop to control its mechanism, where the control is built into the machine rather than from the outside. And what's interesting about that is this is not dissimilar to how emotions like happiness work in the body. They help us regulate our behavior in the world. So this is a, this is a picture of, of my best friend, Pete. And you can see him smiling. He looks uh, exceptional. He looks a bit like a vicar in this picture, actually, with his collar. But he's smiling, he's using some of his 46 muscles in his face 
to communicate his happiness to the world. Um, he's very happy because it's actually the day I got married, and he's looking very happy. Um, but he, um, and he's communicating that in lots of ways. And he is actually a pretty happy chap. He's, you know, he's, you know, he's, he's someone that I've gone to in life, you know, when I'm feeling down, and he's one of these people that's like a radiator and makes you feel warmer and better about yourself with the way that he is with you. And in some senses, that's starting to tell us about what the functionality of happiness is about. In that we all know that some emotions like fear and anger are sort of the fight and flight mechanism. We understand that, that, you know, if we're frightened, it's telling us that we need to do something because there's a threat out there. If we're angry, someone is threatening us or, or violating a norm. But happiness, you know, happiness, what's the evolutionary purpose of happiness? If every human being has this emotion, then it must serve a purpose for us. And the big take-home message around happiness is that if the so-called negative emotions are about threats, happiness and positive emotions are about opportunities. Humanity has needed to survive and thrive. And happiness, enthusiasm, interest, even lower energy positive emotions like contentment, which is a sort of reflective process, these are all helping us function better. They're helping us create opportunities. We're more creative when we feel happy uh, or, or when we're very interested in something, we can commit to tasks which are challenging and difficult for us to do and we get that focused energy when we're taking them on. They're helping us achieve things. They're helping us create opportunities. They're helping us seize those opportunities. And you know, I want to talk today a little bit about work and then, uh, or, or a bit about work and then about communities. And so we can think about what does happiness mean at work? I actually have another friend called Andy who, when we were exchanging ideas, uh, 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 exchanging what we do, you know how when you know someone a bit, in fact, Andy, uh, his son and my son play rugby together. We didn't know each other so well. And eventually, he asked me after a year on the touchline, so what do you do, Nick? And I said, well, I, I, I do a bit of statistics. Oh, what do you do statistics on? I said, well, you know, um, happiness at work. And he looked at me very quizzically. And he goes, look, I understand the word happiness. And I understand the word work. But I just never thought of putting them in the same sentence together. <laughs> and I think that's how a lot of us feel about work. A lot of us think, you know, we don't go to work to be unhappy necessarily. But we don't think of work as a source of happiness. We don't think about happiness at work. Our organizations don't encourage us to be very emotional at work. They're sort of frightened of emotions. I mean, that's rather ironic that they seem frightened of emotions and being as fear as an emotion. But it seems like they worry that if they let emotions in an organization just sort of roll out, that there'll be chaos. No one will think about the bottom line. And I really want to tell you how wrong that is. Because emotions are functional for us. They are, they are a way that we pick up environmental cues and we respond to them. So I've become quite interested in how, you know, whether we can gather evidence about how great happiness at work is. And there are some organizations that are collecting data on happiness, and sometimes people call it engagement at work. Um, and, um, and one big organization does is called Gallup. I think most of you have heard of Gallup. They have this huge uh, survey they do uh, called a global poll where they interview 1,000 people in virtually every country around the world, well over 100 countries. It's a very, very big survey. And um, they, also, um, they also work with a lot of companies around their engagement at work, their happiness at work. And over time, they built up a lot of evidence around what the positive effects of having an engaged and happy workforce are. And um, I know this graph is not going to be very easy to read, so don't worry about it too much. But what they're basically showing is that if people are happier, then they, they're, the first line says absenteeism, that absenteeism goes down, that more people turn up to work. Well, it seems quite obvious that if you enjoy your work, you're going to take less duvet days. You're going to take less days off sick. You're probably going to be less sick, actually, because uh, work is one of the causes of stress and sickness in work. Um, the next two are about turnover, which is about how many staff uh, leave your organization every year. 
Well, people don't leave jobs they enjoy unless they've got another reason for it. So you eliminate the main cause of people leaving your company. The next one's about thefts, is that if you like your company, you enjoy working there, you're not going to steal from it. And uh, they have less thefts, they have less accidents because you're more paying them more attention. And they have um, um, patient, instance, uh, patient instances in, in the healthcare. If, if, you, if your employees are happier, if the nursing staff are happier, you're going to have less incidents. So, for example, I mean, this is a real thing about happiness, which is that when you're in a good mood, you've actually got more peripheral vision. You can see the big picture more. When you're in a bad mood, you slightly narrow down your vision. So if you're in a restaurant and you're trying to get service from a waiter and you're waving and they're not paying any, any attention, it could be they're ignoring you because you're a pain, but more likely it's actually they don't see you. And if they're in a bad mood, they're going to have less peripheral vision and less see you. Now, in a restaurant, that's a bit of bad service. But if this is your drip machine in a hospital, then that actually becomes quite serious. And you can link the well-being of nurses to the, uh, to the critical response time to emergency and to death rates in wards. And there is a correlation between that. Obviously, a lot of the well-being of nursing is due to understaffing and other issues too. But th you know, these are critical things. And then on the right, you can see the positives, where you get more customer satisfaction, you get more productivity and more profits. So happiness is associated with higher productivity. So organizations are crazy not to think about this. Now, what this data doesn't show you is it does not say that happiness is causing productivity. It is just saying that we know that happier workplaces are more productive. The dominant model that most businesses have, that most of society has, is that if we work hard and we perform well, we will be happy. It's like, you know, that's the Protestant work ethic, that's all sorts of things there. In fact, it's actually, um, you know, it, it, we sort of kick happiness into the weekends, into the nights, you shouldn't do it at work, and in fact, some religions kick it into the next life. You know, if you live a good life this time, you'll be happy next time. So we're sort of moving these things out. Well, Gallup also have research on looking at teams through time. So they can actually measure the happiness at time one and the performance at time one. And they test to see whether happiness is predicting performance or performance is predicting happiness, or both. Obviously, happiness at time one predicts happiness at time two. There's a stability to how teams are going to feel about their work. And performance at time one predicts performance at time two. But these cross correlations is what they're called. You do something called structural equation modeling, you know, is very, very, um, is very, very uh, interesting data. So they're able to test which one of these pathways is stronger. And both of the models fitted the data, but model one from happiness to performance was much stronger. And in fact, the researchers said that the model shows that uh, the effect from happiness at work on performance is twice as large as from performance to happiness. That's startling because our whole economic system is based upon this idea that performance, that success, that money predicts happiness. And this is saying it's the other way around, that happiness is predicting success and performance. In other words, happiness is working for you. So happiness works. I would even say it's a serious business. It's one of the slogans we come up with, happiness is a serious business, because the sentence sounds slightly weird, really, and it sort of gets attention. But it's still not taken seriously. If you speak to most business people, or, or like my friend Andy, happiness and work, you know, what's going on here? And I've actually got evidence that this is systematically not being taken seriously. So this is a, a business magazine in the States. It's you know, one of these sort of you know, uh, uh, penny stock things. You know, where should you invest your money? And an analyst in there says that he won't invest in this company. He goes, the management are focused on the employees to the detriment of shareholders. Why would I invest in a stock like that? This dominance about shareholder value and this stupidity of focusing just on that, not understanding that actually focusing on the employees might lead to that. Now, the company he was speaking about is called Costco, right? And it's a huge supermarket. And I, you know, we may all have different views about huge supermarkets, but some of them have great employment uh, policies, you know. Uh, they have great employment policies that are very inclusive. 
uh, and they, you know, very flexible for people. And, uh, and, this, and Costco regularly comes in the great place to work list in the States, these sort of lists of good companies to work. And this is a quote from the, uh, from the CEO. I happen to believe that in order to reward the shareholder in the long term, you have to please your customers and your employees. And actually, I think the only way that you can please your customers is if you first of all think about your employees. You can't magically make your customers happy unless you think about your employees. Well, what's interesting is that a, a very um, smart researcher, and I, I really like this idea, he looked at the share value of organizations that are listed in the Great Place to Work list. And what he did was that the Great Place to Work list is released every year to a big fanfare. It's in Forbes magazine in the US. And the stock market always talks about the need for perfect information in the market, that they need to know stuff. Well, it's there. It's in the public domain. All these companies are listed. Some of them are, some of them are on the stock market. He then creates a sort of pseudo um, portfolio which invests in those companies the day that the, the um, Forbes list is released and then sells them the day before the next list. I mean, he makes a sort of simulation of this and then starts again the next year. And what he's found is every year that has outperformed the stock market. Every year that list has. That information is in the marketplace. Every analyst can see it. And the idiot who wrote that article is actually not doing his job because he's not predicting value. And when you plot it all together, this is how normal companies in the stock market were doing. He's got a very careful benchmark that he works out here that makes it make very comparable to the great place to work list. And the companies in the great place to work list did this over that time period. And what that actually means is that uh, you would have received that amount of money extra for your $100 invested in it, and you actually get that, which is a return on investment of about 2.2 times more over that period. Well, I mean, that's how fortunes are made. I mean, that's how Warren Buffett makes his money. That's how it, and so this, you know, and this is a sort of classic way that business judges itself. And even in that context, happiness is working. I think there's all sorts of other reasons why great places to work are interesting. Um, this is a very interesting company in the States called Zappos. It's an online shoe company, which sounds a ridiculous idea that you should buy shoes online, right? But they have the most amazing customer service. You can return your shoes for 365 days after you've ordered them. And when you ask Tony Shea, this is their CEO, uh, why he did that. He said because 99% of people are good people and they will not abuse that. And the few people that do abuse it, well, we just strike them from our list and we don't sell them to again. So why make a policy that punishes the majority when you can actually deal with the people that abuse the system individually? They are an internet company. They mainly, they mainly are a call center uh, or dealing with queries. And when customers are calling internet companies, they're calling with problems. When you have call centers, they're one of the most scripted, controlled environments that we have in the modern workplace. They're sort of like the modern sweatshop is a call center. Tony only gives his employees two rules to which to answer the phone. Number one, be yourself. Number two, use your judgment. That's it. There is no time limit on the amount of calls. His theory is you're speaking to a customer. I would pay an advertising company to get me to a customer. You're speaking to one. Speak to them. And uh, the longest call on record is eight hours. <laughs> I don't know what the customer was talking about, but it was eight hours. And whilst I don't think he wants to encourage eight-hour calls, what he finds is people don't abuse the system. You know, don't worry about that. That doesn't happen very much. Um, there are legendary emails that Zappos have written out are written, and you can find them on the internet. They're very, very funny. Um, another company is an is a, is a, is a, uh, is a Australian software company called Atlassian. There's lots of very, very interesting software companies about how they do. And they have very five rules by which we live. No bullshit. Build with heart. Don't something the customer. Play as a team. Be the change you seek. I mean, be the change. I mean, we've got Gandhi in people's things here. And um, what I really, really like is, is this is the CEO of Atlassian. And he encourages people just to be themselves. And software companies are quite like that. There's another software company where 
there is absolutely no hierarchy at all. Everyone decides whatever project they want to work on. So if you've got an idea for building a bit of software, you have to build a team in the organization. And the CEO complains that he can't get his own projects built because he can't persuade other people to work for him. And yet they make you know, masses of money because they're actually building things that people want to work on. Other companies like Google have experimented with this you know, one day a month where you can do whatever you want. Atlassian do that. They call it ship it days, where you can do anything you want one day a month as long as you ship it at the end of the day. So it's got to be something you can achieve in a day. And they've had so many products that they've improved by doing that because people actually want to build good things. We like to do, we like to progress our work. We like to do things that we're proud of. So going back to that image of the governor, what I want to say is that you know, teams are characterized by better performance. Happiness at work predicts performance. And happier companies outperform the stock market. And all of the and happiness in this way can sort of act as a positive reinforcing feedback loop in a company where happiness builds performance, builds happiness, builds performance. And it's really, really important. But of course, the point is, can we, can we actually become happier? Because, you know, if, you've got, if you're an employee, employer, you might try to employ happy people and you're sort of, you know, um, uh, and you would not employ unhappy people. Well, that's not ultimately very good as a society because, you know, we're going to be left with all the unhappy people unemployed and the happy people employed, and that really is not going to be very good. And, um, and you know, Larch talked about this earlier. I was involved in a project with uh, the Government Office of Science. They had a foresight project. And, um, and we did a project with them about what would be the well-being, the happiness equivalent of five fruit and vegetables a day. All of us know that five fruit and vegetables a day are healthy. We know we're supposed to eat that. So what I actually said to the, to the guy who was running Foresight was actually presenting another project, a more technical measurement project. I said to him, what we, you know, I said to him, you know, we need to do something that's equivalent to this. And he said, OK. Uh, maybe you can do that. I've actually got £10,000 left in my budget for this project. If you give me a proposal for less than £10,000, you can do a project on this idea you've got. And I was very, very keen that, it's, it, that it was five. And you need to understand with the five ways to well-being that this is a piece of social marketing, is what we call it. It is about a communication of the evidence base. There is, in a sense, nothing magical about the number five. The number five is great because it's a short list. It's a list that people can remember. But, you know, there's lots of things that predict happiness, and we, we tried to pick five big, strong ones. And our, our brief was we had to create evidence-based actions that people could do themselves. These are positive actions that people could do in their own lives, and they could be used in a wide variety of applications. And so these are the five ways. The first one is connect which is that our social relationships are the most important thing for our happiness and our well-being. And in lots of ways, this is not surprising. Every one of us is made through a relationship between our parents. We are born into a network of relationships, a family. We're brought up in a, you know, in a, you know, we're, we're, we're in a community. We're brought up in a school. We are very, very social creatures. Our social relationships predict our happiness massively. There's nothing worse for our happiness and well-being than to be isolated or to be lonely. And modern life often gets in the way of our relationships. We think something else is more important, whether it's on our screens, whether it's at our work, and we neglect, all of us are guilty of this at times, of neglecting the cornerstones, the most important people in our life, and not taking time with them. And so connect is the first one of the five ways to well-being. The second one is to be active, which is that physical activity is great for our happiness and well-being. In fact, all emotions, one of the things that defines emotions is that we have a bodily sensation when we have an emotion. We don't just have a, you know, a cognition is just a thought in our head effectively. When we have an emotion, we're feeling things in our body all the time. So it's probably not surprising that it works the other way around, that we move our body and we're going to feel better. If you're in a bad mood, probably the fastest way out of a bad mood 
is to go for a walk, a run, or whatever it is that you do, and you'll move your body and you'll start to release that energy and you'll feel better. It's not to do what I often do, which is reach for chocolate or alcohol or something like that. It's actually much better to go out and move your body. Um, there's lots of evidence that you know, being active is great for people who are depressed. Um, it obviously is exceptionally hard if you've lived with someone, if you've been depressed, if you've lived with someone with depression, uh, you have a family member, then it is very, very hard to get them to move off the sofa. And actually it's very frustrating being around someone who's seriously depressed because you feel like you could, you could help them if they'd only accept some help. And it's hard to get them off the sofa. But if you can get them out to be physically active and go for a walk, that is going to start helping them uh, move and, and, and release some of their uh, depression. This is not true for bipolar depression, that's more genetically based, but the common form of depression, which is low energy. Um, and, it, and as I said, it's great for happiness. And we all know this, I mean, you know, if someone puts some music on and we start to move or dance, immediately the whole mood lifts here. And we can think about that in a work context. It's obviously very bad for us to sit down for eight hours a day and not move our bodies. Probably every 40 minutes you should be getting up and moving. The third one is to take notice, which is to sort of be engaged with the world, to notice what's going on in the seasons, in the, in the, uh, you know, in the, in the beautiful countryside here, or the, or, the, or, the, or the town, you know, or what's going on with other people around you, you know, being observant and noticing, but also taking notice of what's going on inside you. It's actually what's bubbling up from within you, what's the, what, what are the signals that are coming from within you, and reflect on those, because that's in a way we find what's meaningful for us, what's purposeful for us, what we like doing. So take notice is really important. The fourth one is to keep learning. And the word keep there is there because it's about learning through the whole life course. It's not just about learning at school or at university. It's actually how do we do that? And it's also very informal ways of learning. In fact, I would say that some of our formal learning environments are not well-being generating. Uh, and, uh, you know, we've got exam factories for schools and all sorts of things. Um, but it's about learning. It can be learning to cook a new dish. It can be learning about another culture. It can be learning another language, which is what I'm supposed to be doing at the moment. It could be doing lots of, uh, lots of things uh, that actually get our brain moving. And there's lots and lots of evidence that older people that keep learning have much better health outcomes than those that start to close down. And then the fifth one is give, which is that when we give to other people, we feel good. And in fact, the Dalai Lama says that if you want other people to be happy, practice compassion. If you want to be happy, practice compassion. And there's lots and lots of evidence about this. One of my favorite experiments, psychologists like to run experiments, and one of my favorite experiments around this is that they took a group of students, most psychological research is on students, they took a, a group of students and they gave them, well, different amounts of money, but about $50. And they said, right, one half of you go and spend it on yourselves, that's retail therapy, and the other half go and give it away to somebody. And they came back at the end of the day and the people that had given it away were much happier than the people that had spent it themselves, and they were happier two days later. And so generosity is actually a way to our own happiness, but obviously it has to be done authentically, otherwise it doesn't really count. <laughs> um, and so these five ways of connect, be active, take notice, and keep learning, uh, um, I've got them wrong there, connect, be active, take notice, keep learning, and give, um, are sort of like a invitations that we could try things differently. One of the reasons that I put the three little full stops afterwards was to turn it from, you know, connect as an order to connect as an invitation. And we can do these things in a myriad of different ways. You know, I will bring our personalities, our interests, our strengths to the different ways that you can do these. So there's something that's universal around them that, uh, that we all can relate to them, hopefully. Um, and it gives us lots of permission to try many, many different ways of doing it. So it's just a very light structure that starts to get underneath what well-being and happiness is and help people take actions towards that. Now, the five ways when they were first conceived for the Government Office of Foresight, um, Government Office of Science Foresight program, 
was designed really to be an intervention that individuals could do independent of government, independent of everything. It's supposed to be empowering to individuals. And the project was, as I said, a short project. You know, we ended up designing some postcards that uh, looked pretty, but you know, that was supposed to be it. And they, but what's happened since that, which was in 2008, 2009, is that masses of local projects have started to pick up on the five ways. Uh, in Devon here, uh, they've changed the order of the words so that it becomes a clang, which is connect, keep learning, be active, take notice and give, so that people can use clang to remember what the five ways are, because in some ways a list of five is still quite difficult for us to remember. Um, so they're using those locally, and they're not the only people. So this is a project from South London, which is called Do It Yourself Happiness, which was run around the five ways. And maybe the pictures aren't fantastically clear, but this was with a very difficult to reach group of women who were uh, first or second generation immigrants in South London. And these are the sort of groups that government finds hard to do health promotion projects with. They tend to be stay in their communities and not come out in some ways. And what they found was, was that actually these people not only came the first week, but the second week, the third week, the fourth week, the fifth week, and the sixth week, because they were learning so much that was useful to them. A project in New Zealand has taken the five ways. They call them the winning ways in New Zealand. And they translated them to Maori underneath, and it became the most successful public mental health campaign that they had run. It's been used a lot in the Christchurch area uh, after the earthquake when you know, a lot of uh, New Zealanders um, you know, are proud people and had their lives and livelihoods destroyed, um, were you know, finding it really hard to ask for help. And these sort of projects help people feel that not only could uh, they ask for help, but they could give help and they could be resourceful to other people as well. Um, so you know, very, very powerful. They've been used in schools. This is a project from Stockport where all the kids took the five ways and they rewrote the Red Riding Hood story, um, where, you know, Mr. Wolf, he has a journey to happiness and he does things like he, uh, he learns to dance and, uh, and Red Riding Hood gets to make his hair up at the end. And, you know, it was a way of the kids thinking about the five ways and how they are in their lives. They've been used in, uh, in Norway. Uh, it's a picture of my wife on Norwegian TV, and the word at the top, which I can't pronounce, this is the language I'm supposed to be learning, um, is, um, it means everyday happiness. And these are the five ways in Norwegian. One of the interesting things is when they first translated these into Norwegian, uh, we had the five ways and we had the five words, but then we had lots of ideas underneath that you could do. And suddenly in Norway, under be active, came have sex was involved in there too. And I guess that's just a Scandinavian way of being. But, um, <laughs> Uh, and actually, it started our team thinking about that actually, surely the definition of good sex is that all five ways to well-being are done at the same time. But that's a different matter. Um, but the project that, uh, that's particularly taken off in Norway is one involving kindergartens. Uh, the, the Council for Mental Health uh, Promotion in Norway uh, started a project with kindergartens. They, they, kindergartens are great places because you've got Local kids coming, 95% of kids in Norway go to kindergarten. You've got contact with their parents. It's a nice way to do public health messaging through the kids. And this part was part of the GIVE project, uh, which was that the kids were drawing pictures, they were writing happiness quotes, and then they were going round to random letterboxes and putting little happiness notes in them, <laughs> climbing up like this in the snow and going out there. Absolutely lovely projects. You can read lots more about the five ways to well-being from the New Economics website. Um, there's a lot of things that uh, local governments can think about in there in the applications one. So um, the five ways is not quite like the governor exactly. It's not quite a feedback loop, but they're what we might call, um, technically we call it heuristic. It's sort of a rule of thumb, a nudge, a, uh, a, a clue about... Um, how to be happier. So it can do little things that help us sort of just check and balance and, and, and uh, shape our behavior. Even I, you know, as someone that designed the five ways, I, it reminds me to be more active, <laughs> you know, and reminds me that, you know, that, you know, that when I am in a bad mood, actually the best thing for me would be to go out for a walk. 
Um, and it also reminds me that the times in my life that haven't been so good, particularly about work, actually, have been when I haven't been learning. For me, learning is a really important thing. And that if I've, you know, if I got into a stage, you know, um, uh, which I did at one stage in my career where I just didn't feel I was learning anything, then I start to go a bit stale and start to go a bit. So I think, you know, they can help remind us of some of the things that, you know, aren't going fantastically well. But there is a place at work, you know, where uh, feedback is really, really important. And this is a picture of a famous American guru on management called Daniel Pink. And he, I think he's holding a brain because he'd written a book called something about brains or something. And um, anyway, he, he is quoted as saying that the American workplace is the most feedback-deprived area of modern life. That at work, we seem really, really nervous about giving feedback to people and receiving feedback. And we, you know, which is bizarre, really, because, you know, obviously work is quite important for the organization and all sorts of things. But why is it that feedback gets reduced to this very awkward one-hour conversation with your boss every six months or 12 months? No one wants to do, no one enjoys it, and mainly it's either filled with absolute platitudes, which say nothing, or far too heavy criticism that you don't know what to do with. And why is it not more like a governor, where it's just little pieces of information on a much more real-time process? And what I've become very interested in my work, you know, I like statistics, I like numbers, is can we build, like, sort of feedback governors into organizations? And one of the distinctive features of the governor is that it is not a control mechanism from outside of the system. It's not someone looking down at the system and telling it what to do. It is built into the system. It's a check and balance, just like emotions are built into us and help us respond to the environment. So what I'm playing with, or got a business about actually, is using happiness and happiness at work survey, this one is, this tool is, but it's using happiness data to help organizations know what's going on with their employees on a more daily, weekly, monthly basis. You know, how are they feeling at work? If good feelings at work are really, really important, do you know how your employees are feeling and how they're doing? And, uh, you know, people get sent a sort of simple questionnaire, which is hopefully quite nicely laid out. And then you get all sorts of fantastic data around how people are experiencing work. And it starts to act a bit like a mirror. If any of you are counselors or therapists or facilitators, then really you know what you do for your clients is you act a bit like a mirror for them. You show them how they are themselves. And that's what good statistics can do, is they can act like a mirror to an organization to whatever and just show the organization, reveal the organization to itself. And, and if you feed back numbers in easy to understand ways, um, then people can actually start to see it and they gain insights. At the end of the day, I'm a statistician. I'm exceptionally interested in decimal places, but they are almost totally irrelevant. The I, it's only if they generate insights that can be turned into practical ideas that people put into action that that comes alive. And effectively, we're trying to build happiness insight engines. We have sort of governors in the middle of them, and they look a bit more like this, statistics, you know. But we're trying to create checks and balances for organizations to understand how they're feeling, how people are feeling at work, so that they can respond to that data. That if teams are feeling rubbish, respond to it. Don't just let them drift along, feeling rubbish for ages. Actually come and respond to that. And the five ways to well-being are a little bit like that, but in a different style without the statistics, you know, about helping us check and balance. How are our lives going? My, the guy that gives me you know, financial advice he has it on his fridge, and he says it's like my serenity prayer. I just check it and remind myself that I should be doing these things. So, I think the next revolution that we have in Britain should be a happy one. And we should make sure that happiness works for us all. Thank you very much.